So hello. Uh, today we are going to have a, we are going to speak about how to find the long path in the graph. This is something we already have seen by color coding. Uh, so we already solved this problem, but we are going to solve it today quicker by a faster algorithm than last time and using some algebraic methods, which will be more complicated than today. And we are essentially doing one algorithm for the entire lecture today. So, so that's like, like there's like one single topic. We won't do any like digressions. We'll be just doing one thing for the entire lecture. And I'm reusing some slides that Lukasz did for a lecture a few years back uh, in Gdańsk. So almost all the slides are by Lukasz. I added a few tiny things and fixed a few typos. So the credits to the slides should go entirely to Lukasz. Okay, so let us start. Let us recall what we are doing. Uh, we're solving a problem that we already solved using color coding some time ago. Namely, we have a graph like on this picture and we want to find a path, a simple path. That's the important, that's the difficult part. A simple path using on exactly K vertices. Yeah, so we want to find, and we will call it a K path here for short. And yeah, so on this picture, we have got a K path consisting of eight vertices. Um, and this is a simple path, it doesn't use the same vertex twice. And it's actually a bit non-trivial to find in this graph. Actually, maybe not that non-trivial, but uh, because this graph is actually Hamiltonian, I mean, it has a Hamiltonian path, but yeah, you have got an eight path on this picture. And what we have seen uh, on the lecture, we have seen an algorithm. I mean, we are parameterizing it by K. So we want some F of K times polynomial in N. And we have seen an algorithm with K factorial. That was this algorithm that randomly saw samples a random permutation of a vertex set, like randomly orders, and only keeps edges going in the right direction, like only keeps edges going in the right direction, and now observes that in directed acyclic graph, finding a longest path is polynomial, is the simple dynamic programming algorithm going over topological order. So with probability one in K factorial, with probability one in K factorial, you are, uh, your path is really ordered according to your random order. I mean, exactly ordered, like it survives random ordering of the vertices and keeping only the edges going from left to right. And then in linear time, you can find this path if it survived the random step. So, and then you repeat it K factorial times to get constant success probability. That was the algorithm we discussed a few weeks back. And then we had the color coding algorithm that was a bit more, comp a more, more sophisticated. We did slightly less, uh, we, we, we did a random choice that was had got slightly higher success probability, one in one e, e, e to the minus k, the success probability was, but we got less. So the idea there was to randomly color the vertices with k colors, and with probability roughly e to the minus k, uh, the path that we are looking for was colored with k distinct colors. So it was colored rainbow, and then there was a two to the k dynamic programming algorithm that finds a rainbow path, that finds a path that uses exactly all the k colors, exactly each color exactly once. And by using these colors, we're like, by having these colors, we're like, ensuring that the path was disjoint, that the path was like simple path, it doesn't use the same vertex twice because it was not allowed to use the same color twice. And instead of remembering which colors, which vertices that we, we used, we remember we remembered only which colors we used and that gave us this two to the k states of the dynamic programming algorithm. And that was the trick. Uh, and looking from this perspective as well, this first algorithm of k factorial was also like the algorithm that like by ordering the vertices in the order in which you can use them, you are, you're forcing yourself not to use the same vertex twice because once you already go over a vertex, you can't use it again. There's a fixed order in which you can visit the vertices and you're just finding a subsequence of length k within the subsequence. Yeah, and this highlights in some sense that this k path problem is really a problem about like this jointness problem that you're really like one way walking across the graph, you're looking for a k walk that doesn't use the same vertex twice and this not using the same vertex twice is the difficult part of this problem. So what we'll be talking about now, okay, so there's one thing in between. Uh, you can look into the parameterized algorithms book about how to do it, it's described there neatly. There's a way of doing color coding that improves this two to the e, two e to the k to four to the k. It's like you're randomly coloring the graph with two colors, uh, red and blue, and hoping the first half of the path is red and the second half is blue and then recurs. It's not exactly like that, but it's more or less the same, this idea. So you can somehow like punch this color coding idea into a slightly better constant than it was four to the k. Uh, you can get it four to the k and I'll show you some ideas how to slightly improve it and because it's deterministic and because it's deterministic. And then there were, there was a series of papers uh, around a decade ago 
that actually shows that you can do it in algebraic way. And this is something we won't see exactly this one. There were some group algebras and just like slightly more complicated uh, algebra. We'll be doing something simpler that people understood a bit later how to do it. But people realized around a decade ago that actually you can do it significantly faster uh, using uh, algebraic tricks. I mean, so that not we, we slowly depart from like graph, gra graph theory and the graph theory trick, and we'll be doing some algebraic tricks, and we'll learn how to do them in a while. And what's interesting there, actually later, using based on these ideas, based, or based on similar ideas we'll see today, there was a break for a decade ago. This actually paper that got that got Fox uh, last year that got like test of time award. So like a award after a decade saying that, hi, hey, actually this paper from 10 years ago was very important for the development of the field and we give him award a, a decade later. Uh, so actually Björklund, based on these ideas that we'll see today, observed how to improve Hamiltonian cycles. So we have seen, or you can easily develop based on like subset lattice two to the n time, two to the n times n polynomial in n time to find Hamiltonian cycle in a graph. We can do an inclusion exclusion. This is something we discussed last week. You can do dynamic programming if you don't curve out space. But the, there was a break for a decade ago that you can actually get better than this two to the n to find the Hamiltonian cycle. And this works only for undirected graphs. There's an undirected tricks here. And because these previous ones work for directed graphs, and the algorithm we'll see today will work for directed graphs as well. But this beating two to the n uh, gives uh, beating to the n gives you um, you require some directed graph, and this was only like for Hamiltonian cycles, so those k equal n. I mean, getting cycle and path. Okay, we discussed here Hamilton path if you really put k equal n, but it's if you can solve Hamilton path, it's also easy to solve Hamilton cycle in essentially the same time. And there's a later paper uh, of Bjorkun's friends that actually get these ideas from here to a k path. To the k-path algorithm and get the same base of the exponent to the k to find the k-path in a graph. And but this again requires undirected. So what we'll be doing, we'll be get we'll be more or less doing this one, but we'll be doing it using uh, this framework or this algebraic tricks rather than group algebra. So it'll be a bit simpler. We'll, we won't need that complicated, uh, we won't need that complicated algebraics as uh, so Kutis and Williams approach there before. Okay. So this is a bit of a history, uh, and let's go to the algebraic basics we need here. So for some of you, it will be boring. For some of you, it will be scary now, but we need some algebra. This is algebra you have probably seen on the first year, mostly, but maybe not all of it. So let's, because this is like a bit more specific angle at which we need, okay? So first we need fields. Uh, so field is something where you can add, multiply, but also subtract and divide. Yeah, so this is like when this is a, we have got some set and on this set you can add elements, you can multiply elements, but you can also like you have got the inverses. So you can subtract and you can divide. Yeah, so there's like the pluses, the plus and com the, the adding and multiplying has got the standard properties, including the commutativity. So it's commutative. And uh, yes, and you have got like the additive identity and uh, that has got the inverse and there's a multiplicative identity that has got the inverse, okay? So essentially this behaves, so this is like an object where you can add things, you can multiply things, you can divide things, you can subtract things and it behaves as you expect it. Uh, as you have expected, including you cannot divide by zero because you can easily prove that you shouldn't be able to do so. Yeah, so for example, reals or complex numbers or, uh, or uh, fields, but the more important example for fields now is that uh, uh, we need also finite fields. So we need fields of finite size. And the most ex example that you may see in some algebras are like fields modulo some prime P. So if P is a prime, if P is a prime, then, uh, then numbers 0, 1 up to p minus 1, they form a, they form a, a field which is uh, with the natural operation. So we can add modulo p, this is obvious. You can subtract modulo p, this is obvious. You can multiply modulo p, this is also easy. But the trick here is that you can actually divide modulo p. So like every element has its own inverse. Yeah? For every a in 1 to p minus 1, 
there exists exactly one B in one to P minus one, so that E times B is one modulo P. Sorry for writing it a bit bad, yeah. So this is like some basic fact that I won't prove here, uh, but modulo P you also have inverses. You can divide modulo P and there's also always like in inverse modulo P. So this is something you may have seen on some like algebra or like discrete maths things, which is will be useful for here. In particular, there's a simplest case of that one. There's the field F2, which is just zeros and one and adding modulo two and multiplying modulo two, which is like very simple, like one plus one is zero, one times one is one, one times zero is zero, etc. So it's the inverse of one is one. And it's not very, a very complicated field here, modulo two, okay? And uh, modulo larger number is okay, but the much more non-trivial fact than just multiplying modulo p is that you can actually have a field of you can actually have a field of any power of a single prime. So there's actually for any prime p and for any integer d, for any integer d, uh, there's a field of size p to the d, and it's not it's like it behaves a bit like fp. It behaves like modulo p. Prime model, but it's more complicated than that. In particular, in particular, in this field, you have got this fact that you, if you add p ones, you get zero. Yeah. So this is like it behaves addition behaves like modulo p at least if you add ones, but you can have much more elements. You can have p to the d elements, and we'll be using this field for the case p equal two. So we'll be looking at this field f two but not really at the F2, but at, at the field F2 to the L. So at this moment, if you are not happy with algebraic things, so if you're a bit afraid of, algebra, of, more, of deeper algebra, you can just imagine this as a black box. So this is actually a field that consists of two to the L elements. Okay, it consists of two to the L elements. The L is as you choose them. For L equal one, you get this F2, but for larger Fs, you can do it, okay? Actually, you can do it, you can actually implement it quick on the on the computer. So it's like, look that this is like log of the size, which is means this is L and this is log, log square L, yeah? So it's polynomial, the operations on these fields are polynomial in the logarithm of the field size, okay? So this is like something very quick because if you think about it, like the best you can hope for is to actually represent this using L bits because there are two to the elements. So, I mean, L bits is necessary to like distinguish these elements from each other. So this is really polynomial or actually L log square L in the like bit size of the best possible representation of this field, okay? So arithmetic operations are fast and you can actually handle this field very well. And the important part is that actually this FP to the D has got like adding P ones gives you zero. And like, this is called characteristic, yeah? I mean, the characteristic of the field it's like how many ones you need to add before you get zero. So for in the, for reals, this is infinity. You cannot add ones and get zero in the end. For FP, this is P, but also for FP to the D, this is P. So you add P ones to get zero. And here, so here in this field, because we took two to the L, field two to the L, you can actually get the thing that one plus one equals zero. Yeah, you get this, you get this equality here. And this is, a very important, I mean, this is the reason we took P equal to equal to. We are going to use the fact that if you add the same thing twice, you will get zero. And this is like the, the one of the more most important, the one of the initially most counterintuitive uh, properties of this field we are going to use. So we are we're doing some operations inside the field. So inside, like inside the field, and uh, we'll be using the property that if you add the same number twice, it's always zero. So it's like two equals zero in this field, okay? So this is the property. And now if you want to look deeper into this field, this is a slide for like people that are slightly more interested in how these algebraic things work. Uh, yeah, so we have this field of size two to the L that has got characteristic two, but the other important information is that how you construct these fields, if you look under the, inside the guts, you're taking all the polynomials modulo two. So you're taking all the, pol how does a polynomial over F2 look like? It's just like X to the 10 plus X to the five plus X plus one or something like that. So the coefficients are zeros and ones and you have got one variable. So these are some 
polynomial, uh, this is some polynomial, and then you take this once and you take a quotient of this of this ring of polynomials because this is a ring you can multiply things but you cannot divide things there and what you do you just take the modulo of some fixed polynomial of degree of degree l so you're taking some polynomial of fixed degree l where l is this like this exponent of the size bound and you're taking all the polynomials modulo of this polynomial and this polynomial needs to be like irreducible you cannot make turn it into the product of two smaller polynomials up there so this is how you make it. I mean, I'm not going to prove it to go into gas, but this is really a field that you can make an inverse modulo it. It's not that difficult, but this is how you construct them. The important information is that actually, if you think about this, if you think about this, okay, let's, uh, if you think about this, you're taking this polynomial P and this is of degree L. So for example, I don't know, this is like this X to the 64 plus X to the four plus X to the three plus X plus one where L is equals 64. So we are doing like field of size two to the 64. So you're taking polynomials with coefficients zero and one, so over F2, and you're doing the modulo of this polynomial. So if you take a polynomial modulo this one, you are going to get like, there is a representative, um, a modulo guy that actually has got degree less than 64, yeah? because you can always subtract this polynomial P with some coefficient if you have larger, if you have a degree more, at least 64. So the degree of your representative is exact 64 and the coefficients are zeros to one. So you can think of this element is just a 64 bit number. So you can think of this element just like, like, okay, so this is really like X something times X to the 63 plus something times X to the 62 plus, 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 plus X plus something times X plus, plus something where the something is zeros to ones. So you can think of them as 64 bit number. And the 64 bit number have some like multiplies as polynomials. And then, I mean, what do you, how do you make operations on this field? Just multiply them as polynomials. So like, I mean, as you multiply polynomials and then make modulo this polynomial here. Okay. I mean, this is one irreducible polynomial of degree 64 I wrote here, okay? And it has got small hand weight. So what, uh, what happens actually to this, actually turns out to be useful in many applications, like being able to operate in this field of correct 62. So actually these operations are actually uh, in, implemented in processor. So they are, actually, they are actually processor instructions that takes that takes two 64 bit numbers, assigned 64 bit numbers, interprets them as coefficients of a polynomial and multiplies the polynomial. And you can also relatively easy make an, make an operational processor to take something modulo this polynomial here. It's not very complicated. It's actually chosen so that there are only a few parameters here. So actually implementing these things on a processor on a 64 bit processor is actually relatively simple and relatively efficient. So actually operate, I mean, it's not something super scary that you need a huge library. Actually, uh, Actually, there's like one processor instruction to multiply these things and a few relatively simple bit shifts to actually take things modulo this polynomial written here. So actually implementing field F2 to the 64 is actually not that difficult. I mean, you need to think for a while and you need to learn with a few processor instructions, but it's actually not very difficult to implement a, like operation on this field. So this is not something totally like unimaginable. Uh, this is something that you can actually implement and we will actually implement it and tested it mm. and tested it how these things work. So this isn't something scary. Okay, but let's go back to the theory and let's depart from this scary assembler instructions we are doing here. Okay, so we'll be doing polynomials. Uh, in the previous slides, you have seen already a polynomial of one variable because we used it to define the field, but we'll be using polynomials with many variables and we fix the field. Think of this field being F2 to the 64 or F to the L, okay? Uh, or F to the L. And what we are doing here, I mean, we're defining polynomials and let's make common, uh, let's make some uh, common language here. So a monomial is like something when there's no additions here, yeah? So there's like some X's with some powers, some variables with some powers, and there's some coefficient up front of it, okay? And the degree of this monomial is like the sum of the, how many X's you have there. So the sum of the degrees of the X's. Okay, and here you have an example. Uh, in many cases, also here, we'll be having a lot of monomials that are like multilinear monomials. They're called multilinear. 
multilinear monomials, that means that every variable is with power zero or one. So this is just a product of many variables with maybe some coefficient up front. Okay, so this is actually a multivariate, multilinear monomial of degree 2014. You can guess where the first edition of the slides were presented uh, in which year. Okay, so this is star monomials, that was simple. Then the polynomial is just a sum of monomials, yeah? So a multivariate polynomial. So this is a polynomial with many, with many uh, variables. So we'll be using many, many variables here. And mm, yeah, so precisely we are summing various monomials and we are required that the number of monomials we are summing is finite. So we don't have any series or whatever. No, we want a finite sum here. So this is it. And the degree of a polynomial is the maximum of the degrees of the monomial. So like the maximum sum of the degrees of x's that can appear in one monomial. Uh, so this is nothing uh, complicated. And I believe this is something that happens once in a while on many courses. So I hope I didn't do some very magical theory here for the last two slides. For the moment, I would just to set up the notation so that we understand the same things with the same terms up here. So I'll proceed further and go to examples which is up there. And in these examples, the most important thing here is actually this one, this guy. This guy is the zero polynomial. And the point is that the polynomial, polynomial P of X or P of X, Y or whatever equal one, this is a polynomial of degree zero, okay? It has got one term, one time in the sum end of degree zero, and this is of degree zero. While the polynomial, which is like equal or always zero, this is like of degree minus infinity. There is no term here. There's a difference here. And this is like important term, in, important difference in like the theory of polynomials is that the zero polynomial is the one with the minus infinity degree. It has got no terms. There's nothing you add there. This is just zero everywhere, zero. Okay. So these are like the examples here, the examples here. And now we come to the main first engine. And this is like one of the very important properties. And this is one of the very like, thing used in many, many, many places in algorithms because this is one of the most magical sources of algorithms that run in randomized polynomial time. And we have got, we don't know how to make them not in randomized polynomial time. I mean, to have made, made deterministic polynomial time and we expect it's possible, but we don't know how, okay? So this is the, so this is the lemma that says the following. Say somebody gave you a polynomial, okay? But this polynomial, you don't see this polynomial written like up there, but this polynomial is really like the just machine. You just, there's a polynomial, which is like P of X1 up to Xn, okay? And you can enter the values for X1 to Xn, you can enter the values and it gets the, prod, gets the value. So you can think of this polynomial as some black box algorithm that you give values and he outputs, uh, you give the value, the arguments, it outputs the value, okay? And, uh, or this is like an arithmetic circuit. You can imagine that there's some notion of arithmetic circuit, like some gates that when a numbers multiply or add, and there's some formula how to compute it, but it's not written as a polynomial that you can just see whether it's all zeros or there's some coefficients, but it's written in some convoluted way, or there's like some algorithm, some way to how to, compute the value. So you can think of this, of this polynomial as a black box thing, so that you enter the arguments and you get the value. And you want to ask whether this, this guy is actually always zero, whether this guy is actually always zero, whether this is a zero polynomial or not. And the schwarz zippel lemma, something called schwarz zippel lemma, is actually proven also of the Milo, the Milo and Lipton, says that, hey, a very good way is to randomly choose the arguments randomly choose the arguments and see if there's zero coming out. And this is, and this thing really says, and this lemma really says is that, okay, let's take these guys and let's sample every AI, let's sample every AI, maybe not even from the entire field, but only from some subset of, of, of the field. Maybe you are not even like having a uniform distribution, you're taking just some subset of the finite field and just cho choosing a random value from the subset, okay? For every AI independently of each other, that's important, independently of each other. Then you are actually, the probability that you will hit zero is either always zero. If the polynomial is zero, then you will always get zero, whatever you sample. But if the polynomial is not zero, then the probability, then the probability of actually getting a zero is low. This is like the degree over like, your space among your choosing, okay? 
So if you are choosing S much, much larger than D, if you're choosing S much, much larger than D, then this probability of hitting zero will be low. And you will really distinguish a polynomial that's always zero from a polynomial that's not always zero by sampling a random, if you sample a random values from like, a, like your space from which your sample is much larger than the degree, then the probability that it will accidentally hit zero, even if the polynomial is not zero, is low. And this is what this lemma says. Uh, let's change the color for a while and use the remaining space to prove this lemma. Yeah, so this lemma is, says, okay, if I sample values at random, the probability that I will hit zero is smaller than the degree over this number of choices for each element, unless the, the polynomial is all zero in which case, that's it. Okay, in which case we'll always get zero. Okay, so what's the proof? The proof is induction over induction over the number of variables over the number of variables. And the observation is that for n equal to one, if there's like, if it's just polynomial of one variable, of one variable, then this is just the theorem you may know from algebra and I don't want to prove it, that actually if you have a non-zero polynomial, the number of zero values is at most the degree of the polynomial. Yeah, this is like the fundamental theorem from algebra that the number of zeros is smaller than the number of uh, the degree. A number of arguments that give you zero is more than the degree because you can always write it as a product uh, of x minus the zero times x minus the zero, et cetera, et cetera. And you run out of the degree after the zeros. Okay, so this is this one. So the base of the induction is just the fundamental fact from algebra. You learn about polynomials. And later you can write, okay, so let's say that n is greater than one. So we can actually write this polynomial. So look at x1 and look at the monomial, uh, look at the highest degree. Like, so let's k is the highest degree of x1, k, highest degree of x1, highest degree of x1, okay? This highest degree of x1. So there's actually, you can write something, uh, you can write p as x to x1 to the k times some, times some q of x2, blah, 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 xn, plus some rest. And the rest will have all of them, xn. Okay, so you can write, so you can write, it, uh, you can write the polynomial as like x1 to the k, where k is the highest possible you can find, times something that doesn't contain x1 any longer, plus the rest, and this rest has got like smaller degree of k, like degree of k is smaller than k here, the rest, the degree of k, x1 is smaller than k here. Okay, so you can write it like that. And now I will change color once again and say the following, okay, so now when, so now I'm randomly sampling the values and think of as first I'm randomly sampling values for x2 up to xn and then I'm sampling the value for x1, okay? So I sampled values for x1, so I sampled here a2 up to an, but x1 is still a variable, so I sampled these values, okay? So by induction hypothesis, the probability that this will be zero is smaller than d minus k over size of s, okay? Because I mean, the degree here is at most d minus k because I have got this x1 to the k up front. So this x, so the degree is smaller. Uh, so I can use induction, I can use induction over, and, and there's like, and there's like, I can use induction because there are less variables there, okay? There are less variables there. So actually the probability is smaller than d minus k over s and d minus k comes because the degree is here d minus k. So this is zero with probability up there. Okay, and with probability, and so this is zero. And in the other case, if this is, if we have got a green scenario, so this is a red scenario, and the green scenario, this is non-zero, the green scenario, this is non-zero. And if it's non-zero, then after sampling x2, blah, 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 xn, this will be, the entire thing is a polynomial of degree. This is like some polynomial p tilde of x1 of degree k, because this is the highest, this is the highest time, and this is like a non-zero polynomial, yeah, because this coefficient here turned out to be non-zero. This coefficient here turned out to be zero, so this is a non-trivial polynomial. So it has got probability at most k, k over size of s of being zero after you sample x1, okay? So just to repeat the proof, I'm sampling first x2 to xn, and then with probability d minus k over s, this coefficient near x1 to the k turns out to be zero. And then I have got little control and say, okay, maybe now everything is zero. I don't know. 
Okay, so this is this this event happens for d minus k over s, and if this doesn't happen, if it doesn't happen, then this coefficient is non-zero. So what I'm left is a true polynomial of the degree k of x1. Okay, so it has got probably at most k over s of being zero after I sample x1. So this plus this sums to d over s size of s, and I'm happy. Okay. I mean, you don't need to understand really this proof to understand the rest of this uh, of this talk, but I wanted to present it just uh, mm, just to be like to just to have a complete thing. What you're doing, and this is not very complicated. Okay. So there's nothing really scary, or there's nothing really magic inside this lemma. But it says a very natural thing. If you get a complicated polynomial, but not a zero one, if you sample the values from sufficiently large space of values for the, for the arguments, you will get a non-zero value uh, with high probability. And this is something we're going to use. So the punchline here really is that the punchline here is that okay, if you have got a polynomial as a black box and you wonder if it's a zero polynomial or not just randomly sample the arguments and see if zero comes or not. And this is an excellent test. Uh, this is an excellent test for the zero polynomial because I mean, the prop if you, the, if the space is large enough for sampling, then you have got very good probability of actually uh, hitting a non-zero. And this is the moment why we are using F2 to the L, not FL, F2. Yeah, because F2, you have got only two values to sample. And if you're using a polynomial that, that has got much larger degree, then, okay, this doesn't help to anything because this S is of size at most two. You can sample only like from the set of size two, okay? But now what we are going to use, we are going in our algorithms to take L large enough. We're going to take L large enough such that two to the L is much, much larger than the degree of the polynomials we are going to use in our algorithm. That are going to the degree of polynomials, so that sampling an element from our field will be a good test. Sampling elements, random element from our field, will be an excellent test uh, if some polynomial given as black box is uh, zero polynomial or not, because we'll be sampling like from much larger set than the degree of the polynomials we're going to use. Okay, and this is the reason we are playing with this two to the l, because we are at one side, as you will see in the later slides, we'll need. Uh, characteristic two for all our tricks to work, but on the other side, we need the field to be large enough so that it's much larger than the degree of the polynomials we're working with. And that's why we are uh, struggling with this poly field of size to the L. And that's why we're even discussing it. Okay, so that was the tool. Uh, so the take home message from this lemma is that actually, if you have a polynomial and you want to know if it's zero or not, just evaluate it on the random arguments. And this is an excellent choice as long as you, it's an excellent test as long as the, like, the randomness is over large enough set, much larger than the degree of the polynomial. That's it. Okay, so now let's move to longest path. And yeah, so as we have got our algebraic tools prepared, we move to longest path. And so this is, uh, we're doing, we, this is the running time we hope to get today. This is the running time we hope to get today. And just to be on the same page, this is a notation we're using in many talks before already, and I used it, I think, the previous time, but just to be on the same page, uh, that uh, brackets, square brackets of K, this is just the set of numbers from one to K. We'll be using this notation a lot in what follows. Okay. Uh, okay, so what do we want to do? First, the first twist is that we'll be doing a really detection algorithm. Our algorithm will really detect if there's a K path. It will be quite difficult to reproduce this K path from the run of the algorithm. It will be really like doing some polynomial and we'll be proving that this polynomial is non-zero if there's a K path. And then we'll take this polynomial, it will be given in a very awkward fashion for us. I mean, we'll define it in a very awkward fashion, and then we'll be randomly evaluating this polynomial, I mean, evaluating this polynomial at the random point, at the random arguments, and this is, will be how we'll check if there's the graph has a k-path. Okay, that's like the overall structure. And one of caveat of this approach is that there will be no way of actually getting this k-path that gave us this one. It will just magically appear in this, uh, in this polynomial. Okay, so this is the approach. So the first try is to actually like, okay, so let's just have a polynomial that gives some monomial, some unique monomial to any K path, some unique monomial to any K path, and that's an excellent one. It satisfies the first ballet, 
because well, I mean, if there's no k path, then the sum is empty and it has zero. If there is like some k path, then the sum has monomial. There are some monomials, and as long as we guarantee that the monomials are distinct for distinct paths, now no cancellation will happen modulo two because we have characteristic two, and this will be a non-zero polynomial, and we are happy. But the problem is that to test this equal zero here, we actually need to efficiently evaluate a polynomial. Okay? We need to actually efficiently evaluate this polynomial, and I mean, evaluating this form, I mean, doesn't look more simpler than just listing all k paths in a graph. Okay, so this is. Listing all k-paths seems even more difficult than just testing if there's a k-path. So that seems very, actually you can actually prove that listing, counting k-paths is more difficult. So, um, so maybe k-paths there. And one thing comes to mind is that actually k-paths are difficult. K-paths are difficult because uh, we want them to be simple paths. And if you want, if you think about counting k-walks, it's really easy to count k-walks in a graph. You're just essentially pow taking a k power of the ADJC matrix and summing all the values there. And this more or less the number of k walks. I mean, you may care about like some direction, something like that, but I mean, it's relatively easy to count the number of k walks or you can also think of dynamic programming algorithm. Yeah? I mean, how many, uh, how many ways you can add up in this vertex within i steps or something like that. But it's more or less the same as powering the IJC matrix, okay? So the, the second property we're going to use here is that actually walks, are much easy to count or to operate or do something than paths because we don't really care about this disjointness that we don't use the same vertex twice, okay? So actually we can think of a monomial that actually sums over all k walks and gives some monomial depending on this k walk. And you can hope that if you define this monomial in a decent way, in a way that actually, mm, if you find this monomial in a way that Somehow, like uh, uh, you're giving this monomial in a way that somehow like make has a good product structure over the next step, then this dynamic programming, say, think of dynamic programming that counts the number of k walks by just having a cell, okay, and how many ways you can end up in this vertex with i steps, uh, then that actually this one will actually compute this more complicated sum, not count the number of k walks, but sum some strange monomial values over all k walks, okay. But the point here is now that, uh, hey, but actually, how do you distinguish now walks from paths? Because you end, in the end, you want paths, not walks. Yeah, you want to count number of paths. And the trick is, the trick is that, uh, okay, that will go. The trick is that, okay, we want this thing, but we want to make this monomial so special so that for, things that are walks but not paths, there will be two, I mean, this monomial will appear even number of times here, so that actually a few walks or a few objects we're actually counting here in a moment will actually give us the same monomial, and this number of these monomials will be in the end even, and they will cancel out in characteristic two. So in so we are going to use the fact that if a, in a sum, some term appears even number of times, then as we are working field of characteristic two, it will get, it will cancel out and be zero in the end. Okay, so that's the trick we're going to use. And now, so this is like the try we're going to say have here. Okay, so this is like the most important trick now. I mean, this is the rough idea that will be formalized on the next slide. But the idea is as follows, we won't be, only counting walks, but we'll be counting walks with a bijective lab labeling of the vertices. Okay, so let me just let it sink for a while. So I'm thinking of a walk. So a walk is just like a like an ordered sequence of k vertices. You go from there to there to there to there, or k or k minus one edges. Okay, so they are just walks. But you not only think of a walk, but you are also placing labels, labels are numbers from one to k on the consecutive, on the vertices you're visiting. And you're just also choosing the permutation in which you give the labels. So you're going over the walk, okay? You're going over the walk, and whenever you step on an vertex, you issue a label to this vertex, okay? You issue a vertex to this label, and I mean, you choose your permutation in which you choose, you issue the label, okay? The point will be, in a moment, will be that 
if you are having a walk that visits the same vertex twice, this vertex will receive a few labels. Okay, this vertex will receive a few labels, and the monomial, the monomial depending on the walk and the labeling we are doing here, will not distinguish. Well, I mean, say there's a vertex that received label three and la label five. Okay, I mean, okay, and this picture, this vertex received label two and label four. Okay, this vertex received label two and label four. Okay, and the monomial will not distinguish the walk where this walk went and gave label two, then went around here and gave label four from the walk that walked here, gave first label four, then went this loop and then gave label two. So our trick is that actually this monomial want to distinguish the ordering in which a vertex visit multiple times received its labels. And that will be the source of the like the cancellation that they will actually like this monomial will be appeared twice for this picture, one from the, from the same walk, but one from the labeling that this vertex, this vertex visit twice received first four, then two, and from the labeling when it received first two and then four. Okay, that may be now in the air or like very fishy uh, or like a bit like that. So let's do the precise, precise definitions and calculations in the next slide. Okay, so this is our hero. What are we going to do here? Okay. So we are going to introduce vert we are going to introduce two types of variables. Okay, every edge will get its own variable. So we have got a lot of variables. That's what what I said. We are going to use a lot, uh, a lot of variables. So every edge will get its variable. So every edge gets its variable. So there's x e on top of one every edge, and now every vertex. And every label, okay, receives a, a receives a it receives another variable okay so this is really like n times k variables here and this means like th this variable means you can think of the meaning okay this vertex received this label label okay okay so x e means you walked over at e okay think directed graph i mean it's good to think about directed graphs now it's easier to think i mean it also works in direct ones but easier to think about directed graphs now okay so Xe means the walk wa went over edge Xe, okay? And Y, VL means, okay, vertex V received label L, okay? So this is so this is what we are going to, this is the polynomial we are going. We have got this, okay, this M times N times K variables, I mean, M Ks and N times K Ys, M Xs and N times K Ys, okay? There's this polynomial. And this polynomial goes over all possible k, k vertex walks in the graph, okay? Over all possible ways of in which order we assign lab labels along this walk to the vertices. And for a fixed walk, and for a fixed ordering, how what are the consecutive labels you 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 assign to the vertices visited on the walk? You are producting, okay, which edges did you use? Which edges did you use? And which vertices received which label, okay? But the most important thing now is that here the trick is that you're not you're only saying that the vertex v i received label l of i. You're not saying that the vertex v i received label l i on i step. You're not. I mean, if the vertex, if I mean, if you visit the same vertex twice, okay, then this then I mean you could get and you are getting a label you're getting some label I mean th this variable doesn't like remember or doesn't like it's not I mean this monomial doesn't change regardless whether you get this label in the second visit or on the first visit I mean you get the same I mean this is like just the index here is that this vertex received this label there's no encoding on which step it used there okay so this is our this is our like polynomial here. I I try to give some intuition where it come from, and now I want to try to prove that this is actually a very good uh, polynomial. I mean, solves all our problems in a moment. So let's try to analyze this polynomial. Okay, uh, let's try to analyze this polynomial. Okay. Mm. So first, I want to say that if this one is evaluated in a field of characteristic two, so two equals zero then 
the monomials corresponding to non-paths, the walks that are not paths, will cancel out. Okay. So okay. So let's look at the walk. So let's fix some walk and let's fix some bidirection. Okay. So this is a walk. Uh, okay. So I'm just I would just write this one and we just draw on a, on a side. Let's that will be easiest. So there's some walk that starts like v1, v2. Okay, and it visits the same place twice, and it ends at some vk. Okay, and it's at step vi a and at step vv, it visits the same vertex twice. Okay, visits the same vertex twice. And if there are many multiple visits, we may choose the Rex first one, but I mean, don't worry about it. Let's grab the intuition. The idea is as follows. Okay, so now, and there's some labeling. So this guy gets label L of one, this guy gets label L of two, blah, blah, blah. Then this guy gets label L of A, then this guy gets label L of A plus one, blah, 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 blah. And then this guy also gets label L of B, okay? So this monomial corresponding to this walk will be like, okay, there will be some X edge V1, V2, X V2, V3, okay? So there will be all these edges we walked over, okay? Times, and there will be like, the vertex V1 will receive label one, blah, blah, blah. And there will be like the vertex VA will receive label A of A, blah, blah, blah. And then somewhere there will be vertex VB will receive L of B and more, okay? So these two terms, let me change color. These two terms will appear, will appear this monomial. And the point is that this monomial will be exactly the same if in this permutation L we take this L prime here, this is defined as L prime here, that swaps uh, A and B, that swaps the values at A and B, okay? So this is like what happens here. So this is like L prime L of, L of one, but here it gets L of B on the first encounter and L of A on the second encounter, okay? So the second, so I was, I'm saying that if I look at this walk and this bijection, and if I look at this walk and bijection L prime, which is the same bijection, but the values at the A and the B are swapped, are swapped, then uh, the observation is that I get exactly the same monomial. Yeah, I mean, there will be again, like here I will get LV of A, L of B, and here I'll get LVB, L of A, but VA is the same as VB, so this will be like the same two variables. These two variables will be the same two variables as this one, so this will be the same monomial, okay? So we can think either you can think of taking the lexicographically first, lexicographically first place where the vertex, the walk visits itself and then swapping there, or you can actually think in these terms that maybe let's take the gray one. And if there's a walk that visits itself multiple times, okay, then I mean you can you get the same monomial. I mean, you now look at the labeling L of one, L of two, how you get there. And you can actually like at every vertex you visit multiple times, you can permute in which orders the labels were got, were assigned there and you will get the same monomial. So for any walk, that's not a simple path that has got like some places you visited at least twice, there will be like an even number of labelings because they will be like, okay, there will be like two options here, maybe six options here because there are three labels. So there are six permutations. Etc. So there's like always an even number of labelings that give the same monomial, unless you visit every vertex once and there's no way to have got twice the same. Okay. So this is like the this is like the this is the trick here. Yeah. So the trick here is that okay, we are using you know, summing over walks because walks are simpler uh, to count and to like make them programming, and we'll see it in a moment. But and the trick is that we are using these labels. To say that okay, if we visit the same vertex twice, then the same monomial will appear even number of times. But only if we, uh, but if we don't do it, then the monomial will appear only once. We'll see it on the later slides. Okay. Uh, so this is like okay. So this is like what I said here. Uh, so I mean, this is like there's a formal proof that if you make the lexicographic first part where the think I just, you're just pairing up. But I think uh, for me, the better intuition is that actually uh, like, okay, if you have one walk, then the num then one labeling, I mean, one monomial will appear from like the number of labelings being like, okay, if you're 
happen at one place to be twice and there are two different ways of ordering the labels there if you happen in one vertex like four times there's like four factorial ways of ordering labels there etc so, yeah. so this is the intuition we have here okay uh, so we have proven the fact that actually if this polynomial is non-zero then there's a k-path because all the non-k-path walks all the walks that are not paths will actually cancel out okay so we have proven in a sense one direction so far that okay the bad guys cancel out that the monomial that the polynomials the monomials coming from the monomials coming from walks that are not paths cancel out and they don't appear in the end the point is that what i already highlighted is actually the simpler direction is actually that uh, if you have a simple k path so if actually your picture looks like this so actually there's not there's like a walk going like this this v1 v2 blah 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 up to vk then actually the monomial the monomial from there that actually this guy gives you k factorial different monomials okay this guy actually gives you k factorial different monomials because okay there's some labeling l so this gives l of one this gives l of two this is l of three blah 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 this gets a l of k and now if you look at this monomial the observation that from this monomial you can decode the walk and the label it so if you if somebody gave you this monomial like x e1 x e2 blah 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 x e k minus one some edges and then some y v blah 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 then you actually can look at these edges and if it is edges for a simple walk now i'm using the fact that the graph is direct this is a direct graph yeah so let's assume this is everything in direct graph so if you look at this edges going up there then you actually see this walk yeah you just have a set of edges but if the edges make a simple path then you see this path i mean there's no ambiguity here you see the entire path and then once you see the once you see these variables you see okay the first vertex which label got the second vertex which label got the third vertex which label got etc so you can actually looking at this monomial you can decode the walk by looking at the set of edges and you can decode the labels because every vertex every vertex is to one so you see from the monomial which label it got okay so if somebody gave you the monomial then you see the labeling and and the walk so that means that it will not cancel out that actually for every walk that's a Calf, there will actually k factorial different monomial here for k factorial different labelings and they'll be all distinct and they won't cancel out because only this walk with fixed labeling can produce this fixed monomial up there because you can decode the walk the path and the labeling from the monomial itself okay so this is like the proof so the proof is that okay if there's a k path then actually this polynomial will be non-zero because there's some non-trivial monomial up there There's some non trivial monomial there. Great. So we have got our mm, so we have got our thing. So we have got our thing that okay, we have got our polynomial, that's great. That well it's non-zero if and only if there's a k-path in the graph, which is like what we really wanted up there. But what we want now, okay, we define this polynomial, but now we want to evaluate it. Remember that first we said okay maybe we just should just add some monomial for every k path and be done and we said okay this is like very bad idea because it's even more difficult to iterate enumerate all k paths than to find one so we're making our problem even harder and we said okay but we'll be using walks instead of paths to make it easier to evaluate but we so far didn't do anything about it yet so we didn't say about how to evaluate these polynomials and the trick is that actually uh, what we uh, the trick is that actually we defined it and we'll see in a moment that actually we in some sense mimicked this intuition that counting k walks is simply in a graph because there's a neat dynamic programming algorithm aka multiplying uh, adjacency matrix a few times uh, so actually like evaluating this polynomial will be easy for the same reason so if you think about it i mean it's actually not i will do it on the next slide but it's actually not very difficult to take uh, to evaluate this polynomial by this type of dynamic programming that we used before like for every vertex uh, mm, like for a vertex how many guy paths of length i end up here but now if you are at vertex v we want to un get some partial sum of some things because we want to evaluate this polynomial and we also want to remember which uh, labels did we already use because I, the 
there's like this labeling and uh, we want to be bijective and this using different labels, this will be the source of this two to the k factor in the running time bound. And remember that we need this factor because we need an exponential running time bound in the end because we are solving an NP-hard problem. So somewhere an exponential running time needs to pop out somewhere here and this will be like in this evaluation. And this will be exactly in this thing that we want this labeling to be bijective, to be like k different labels up there, okay? Uh, so, but now since we already had the previous lecture and we know what inclusion exclusion is, what we really want to do is that we want to, um, we want to, um, we can use inclusion exclusion to also bound, have polynomial space. So what, what's really written here is that actually, okay, if I want something bijective, I can uh, do inclusion exclusion over the range of this one. So bijective means, bijective thinks of like the image is the entire k. So what's, what's really up there, so think of like using the inclusion exclusion, think of, okay, I have got this functions from k to k. Okay, so my space, the entire space is just all functions, all functions from k to k. Okay, and the AI for I in K, as are the functions, these functions such that nothing goes to I. For every J, F of J is not I. So I is not in the range of the function. F of J is not I, uh, F of J is not I. So I want to really look into like the intersection of OI bar, the intersection of OI bar, but the point, the intersection of a bar and the inclusion and exclusion says that I can as well look at the minus one to the size of x, uh, minus one of size x intersection of a i, uh, of i intersection x. So I can make over this sum over x side k that I can use over all this sum. So I can use at all the labelings that don't use, this is just the labelings that don't use the values from x. And this is what, what really is written here on the left in, on the slide is that actually, okay, if I dropped, so let's think in the following fashion. If I drop L, if I drop uh, the requirement that the labeling is bijective, I can use any labels I want on the vertices, then actually counting the, uh, evaluating this polynomial is actually pretty simple. Uh, this is just the generalization of this dynamic programming I mentioned that counts the number of k, k walks in the graph. We'll see it on the next slide. And I want to say that at the cost of like two to the k operations, two to the k operations, I can do inclusion exclusion. And instead of counting like this monomials for all, mm, this monomials for all uh, bijective labelings, for all bijective labelings, I can count all the monomials and I just, for all ranges, like for all possible ranges, uh, for all possible ranges, and then uh, this monomial for all possible ranges, and then add it with po po correct plus minus signs, and the inclusion and exclusion we say that is we say that is exactly the same. Okay, so now by paying two to the k in the running time bound, instead of summing over all uh, l over all bijective l, I'm summing over all l from x to some k minus x. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just narrowing the range. I'm giving the range and I'm not saying anything about being bijective or whatever. I'm just giving like a fixed range and I need to sum over all ranges what the, mono, what, what the values of the monomer here. Okay, so this is like what gives me inclusion exclusion here. And the rest is just dynamic programming here, algorithm here. Yeah, so I mean now X, uh, so this is like, uh, so this is what we get from from the inclusion exclusion. Now the trick is that minus one is one modulo two because we're working field of six two. So what we really have here is that, I mean, this we don't really need to care about this minus ones from the inclusion exclusion. So we have got, the, um, so we have got like the inclusion exclusion says that instead of looking at bijective labelings, we sum over all possible ranges and some labeling using this range with the monomials. And this is exactly the same because minus one is one. Okay, so actually what we have here, if you change the summation, we're looking over all possible ranges, we're going over all walks, we're going over all labelings using exactly this range, and we're looking at this monomial that we defined before using this range, okay? So this is our to do the K factor. And the point is that the rest, as will be on the next slide, 
the rest, this is just a polynomial time computation. This is just exactly this dynamic programming that counts the number of k walks ending at some vertex of ending some vertex. Uh, but you need to add a few more coefficients that are coming from the things you randomly chose. So what you're doing, you're summing over all walks and you're summing over all uh, over all labelings, but these labelings are just independent. I mean, every vertex gets an independent label from set X, and then you have got this monomial that multiplies uh, all these values. So let's look at it. Mm, yeah, yeah. So there's like okay, so T of V D is just okay, uh, like the sum of partial objects, the sum of partial the sum of partial objects. Uh, of length for walks of length d ending at vertex v or starting at vertex v it doesn't matter i mean you can start or you can i mean here Lukas wrote it with starting at vertex v so think of all you look at all the walks that have got the vertices and start with vertex v and you use all the labels and you're having the monomer here okay and the point is that okay this is very simple if you have got if d equals one this is just the sum of possible labels at this vertex. And otherwise, if you have got more than one step to do, you just do one step and then look in the dynamic programming table. So, and take the correct cell up there. Okay, so you're just doing, okay, you're get taking a label for this vertex, iterating over all edges to step up, step out of this vertex and continue for the remaining D minus one steps. So what I'm doing here is not, 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 not nothing more complicated uh, done, not much more complicated than just counting the number of k walks, but just adding some coefficients here. And just remember the setting we're working here. You have got this, the values of x's and the values of y's. You have got sampled. I mean, they're just fixed values. So every edge has got a random value of xe. Every vertex and the label has got the var fixed value of yvl of like what's the, what's, the va what's the value of the variable this vertex gets this label, yvl. Okay, and then you want to compute the value of this polynomial, and you're doing this as by, by this dynamic programming algorithm. Just, just like goes over the walks and like multiplies, like has this partial sums of that's like sums over like d walks with labels with values of k. Okay, so this is just uh, uh, dynamic programming here, and as you see, this is like this really k times number of edges times because the sum here is like k. And here you will see every edge once in the sum. Actually, actually, I think it's k square really because there's like k times and k from this d. So I think it's really k square here. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. That doesn't matter much. What's the polynomial here up there? Sorry for not being careful. Okay. So this is uh, the dynamic programming, and the punchline here is that okay. Uh, the punchline here is that we can actually compute it and uh, we can actually call this, compute this polynomial. And let's look at the fact that, okay, but we did some dynamic programming algorithm. Yeah, we have got this k squared times e, but this time is really operations in our field. Yeah, we're just multiplying and adding in our field. We are not doing something. So we need to also take into account that we are operating with this field. I told you that if you use field two to the 64, there are actually some bitwise operations, but let's stick to theory for a while. And in theory, okay, what's the degree of this polynomial? It's 2k minus one. There's like, I mean, you have got these two products and you see the degree up here. So what you really, so remember that you want to use the Zippel's first five Zippel lemma. So in the end, you want to sample values and have a good, good probability that actually if something is non-zero, then the value is non-zero. So you want the size of the field to be larger than 4K, which means that actually your L needs to be larger than log, log 4K, okay? Which is like very, very, very small, okay? I mean, you're exponential in K, so you're going to use this algorithm for like K being like a few dozens or something like that, because there's two to the K in front of it. So like two to the 20 or two to the 30 is already a lot, okay? And L is larger than this one. So let's say K equals to 30. So this is log 120. Uh, so this is log 120. So what's log 120? This is seven. Okay, so two to the seven is okay. Two to the eight is okay. Okay, or L equal eight. So actually having a field of size two to the eight would be get a decent success probability. Okay, because uh, you get a decent success probability. Uh, so L equals seven or L equal eight. So that 
remember that our elements of the of the our elements of the field are actually uh, bit strings. So this is actually like one byte. So you can think L equal weight and you can operate on the field F to the eight and get like a constant success probability for like K equal 30 or something like that. Or you can actually use 64 bit integers uh, in your processor and use the field to, uh, to the 64. And now your success probability will be like, okay, so there's like the degree is 2K minus one. So the degree is something like with K, the degree is something 59 and your scope is 2 to the 64. So your failure probability is like super tiny. I mean, this is like 60 over two to the 64. This is like super, super tiny. I mean, I mean, there's like, I mean, this is something that you can ignore. I mean, this, uh, this failure probability. So using field two to the 64, if you are doing two to the K time algorithm, so you are not going to feed it with K larger than a few dozens, then using the field two to the 64 is like almost, completely safe. I mean, the probability that there will be a failure is like negligible really. And you can also think of using field of size two to the eight to speed up computations, but then you need to be careful with the, because the failure probably is actually like, I don't know, at least a few percent or even more in your fix, yeah? So actually there was a paper a few years back doing some experiments with similar algorithms, with this type of algorithm, and they used both the field to the 64 when everything is always correct and you don't need to worry about failure failures and actually feel two to the eight when you actually sometimes need to repeat computation. So like be careful that, that there will be like false answers and you need to bad answers and you need to take be aware of that. And they were actually comparing like the efficiency of different things is two to the eight, which is a bit faster because I mean, you can do in parallel a few operations if you're smart, but on a processor, but also you need to be careful about like for bad answers and yeah. So that's an interesting thing. But the punchline here is that even in theory, like the operation is like of size log k log log k. So the operations give you polylogarithmic in times factors. So as we have two to the k, and there was some k square, which we don't much care about what's k square or k cube or k here. So if you add on top of it, like log k log log k, then nobody would really care. Squared, then nobody would really care. What I'm just saying here is that this arithmetic this arithmetic from this field is actually really negligible. In theory, it is some polylog in K, and in practice, this is really some quick uh, processor operations because you can use K equals K. I mean, you can use uh, two to the sixty-four and have negligible error uh, and have negligible error. There was also an implementation that if you use two to the eight field of size today, then actually you can tabulate the, I mean, instead of doing processor instructions, you can have a full multiplication and inverse tables inside your memory or inside your cache actually on a processor and you can like have a lookup operations. Like you can have a full multiplication and inverse operations of your field and you can have lookups in on level one cache and that's also quick. Okay, so this is like uh, one of the like more implementation issues here, okay? So the conclusion of the talk, uh, the conclusion of the lecture is that actually there is a very neat um, algorithm that tests in some two to the k times, and I think there's actually k square here, uh, polynomial space wherever there is a k path. And this is like one-sided Monte Carlo. I mean, it runs in this time and with some probability, it will not discover k path even if there is a k path. So it can say no, despite the fact that there's a k path. This is this moment when the polynomial is non-zero, but you are so unlucky with the random choice of values and the value is zero of what your evaluation, but you can mitigate it by having large enough field and field of size two to the 64 is large enough for most reasonable, for anything reasonable you can input to this algorithm. The important, the important trick we used here was that we used the combination of the facts that uh, counting walks is much more easier than counting paths with the fact that like mod in field of modulo two, uh, the field of characteristic two things, the same things cancel out in if you add twice. So we will be very carefully crafting our polynomial so that uh, monomials coming from walks that are not paths will cancel out in the end. And that was this labeling was this main trick. And this labeling is actually a very general trick. I mean, it's really a disjointed trick, yeah? So we had some sequence of K vertices and we put labels there and the cancellation happened if the same vertex appeared twice in the sequence. 
and we really didn't use the fact, I mean, we use the big fact that there's a path, but you can actually, we'll see actually in tutorials that you can use it for many things, that if you like pack disjoint, pack objects and you want to divide them disjoint, then if with every object, with every element of an object, you put a label there and uh, then you can use exactly the same trick to ma make sure that it is disjointness. So this is actually a very general trick and you can, um, like for keeping this jointness of some objects or keeping the fact that you're not reusing the same object twice. So in general, it gives you, if you're having in, in the end, like L elements in the end, or L is a bit number, K elements in the end, K elements of your universe in the end, and you want not to use the same element twice in your things, then adding these labels, like bijective label to them and then doing these algebraic operations, you pay to do the K for this inclusion exclusion of this operation or for this evaluation, but this is an algebraic trick that, and to pay randomization, but this algebraic keeps that keeps you disjointed. And this is actually a very general trick. I think Wojtek would be using at least one or twice these on the tutorials in, for different problems up there. And yes, so this is it, what I want to say, what is it? what I want to present it today. So as I promised, today is a bit shorter. So are there any questions to the talk, to the lecture? 